Okay. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, the virtual meeting of the Legislative Redistricting Advisory Commission. Uh, my name is Carl Arrow. I'm the chair. We have uh, all of our members with us. We have Senate President Bill Ferguson, Speaker of the House Adrian Jones, House Majority Leader Eric Ludke, uh, Senate President Pro Tem Melanie Griffith, Senate Minority Leader Brian Sonnenair, and House Minority Leader Jason Buckle. Um, we're going to try to move through this pretty quickly. Um, I'm just going to start with a couple general remarks uh, that I like to do. Uh, generally, redistricting is complicated but essential. Uh, the primary objectives of basically is to get one person, one vote, uh, and to basically provide the opportunity for people to elect uh, candidates of their choice. Um, it becomes a complicated process for a couple of reasons. Uh, we all know that population increases, but it doesn't do so evenly. Uh, some areas gain, some areas lose, and uh, it's really a matter of not only have you gained or lost, but how that happened in relationship with every other area. There are obviously legal and constitutional criteria to be dealt with, and often they conflict. Uh, and they're a little bit different for legislative districts as opposed to congressional districts. Um, in Maryland, we obviously have a very diverse population. Uh, we also have an incredibly complex geography. Um, so these are uh, things that add to the complexity of the task. Legislature does have this constitutional responsibility to act, and this commission was created to receive public input and develop um, congressional legislative district and plans. So we're here to listen. Um, so having said that, uh, I think I should also remind those that will testify that we will have a time limit on testimony. We'll try to be flexible, but generally we've been saying five minutes um, is your time to do it. Um, we've also got testimony that you may have submitted as part of the record, and of course this meeting will be archived as well. So with that, um, let me turn it over to uh, Michelle Davis, who is the um, uh, with Department of Legislative Services and is the redistricting uh, coordinator there for that. So Michelle, you are up. Good afternoon, everyone, members of the commission, members of the public. Uh, I wanted to thank you, Carl, for doing my presentation for the past couple of meetings when I wasn't able to make it here. Um, and I'm just going to give a short overview uh, this time of uh, the population growth in our state and what that means for redistricting. Um, I think Jody, are you going to share the screen for me? I think we have this set up so that um, Jody is going to um, share this presentation. Great, thank you. You can go right to the second slide you don't mind, thank you. Um, so this is just a reminder um, of the important uh, numbers that we, we need to use this go around for redistricting. Uh, so the optimal um, number of people in each district for each type of district is here. Uh, the state's adjusted population is at the top. Notice that it is um, not the same number as what the Census Bureau reports. That is because by statute, Maryland is obligated to adjust its census number uh, to account for prisoners and out of state prisoners uh, who are not re residents of the state when they're incarcerated are taken out of that number. So that changes the census number a bit. Uh, at any rate, that is the, the number that needs to be used uh, for all redistricting maps um, and then the numbers at the bottom are the are what we call the ideal district numbers for each type of district. So congressional district, um, a senatorial district, and we also um, are able to use a single member and two member delegate districts. So those are the numbers um, that you would use. And generally for not for congressional, but for the legislative map is that there's a plus or minus five percent. Uh, sort of wiggle room that we can use um, to draw districts. And the congressional map has to be very, very close within just a few people. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a map um, to visually show where um, a lot of the growth in population has happened in the last decade in Maryland. Um, notice that the, the, the lighter tan areas 
uh, lost population. And as you get into the darker blues, you get the most population gain. Um, you're gonna see this echoed on, on the next two maps. Um, you're gonna see how central Maryland, you see how the four counties and mostly central slash um, Southern Maryland um, and Frederick up to the north, um, which had the most population growth, how that is going to sort of affect the movement of uh, legislative districts. Uh, so keep that in mind. So next slide, please. So this is another map uh, that I made, so it's not as pretty. Um, and if you can read it, um, it is uh, the legislative districts as they are now. Um, and it tells you how much they, uh, well, it sort of shows you how much they've grown or, or not grown by telling you um, how far they are away from the current ideal district number, those numbers that we uh, looked at in, in the first slide. Um, so notice that the districts that are in red are underneath that ideal. And, it, and it, the number on it shows you about by how much. Uh, so the districts in red are under. And the districts um, in green are within that ideal. Um, and the districts that are blue have gained enough population that they are now over. Um, and you can see that uh, this sort of color scheme echoes the, the population map that we saw before. So what this means for a, a, a legislative district when you're rebalancing them and drawing a map and redistricting is that if an area has had a loss of population, right, uh, then those districts have to get bigger. Um, so if you can look at the Western Maryland um, in the top left there, that, that those districts are going to have to move further east or wherever they can go to get more population. And districts that have too much population in them, if you look at Central Maryland, um, they get smaller because you need less, you want less people in those districts. So geographically, the size of the district will get smaller. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and this, this map uh, is actually showing uh, for each county. So now we're looking at counties as opposed to districts. Uh, which, how many districts can you fit, uh, so to speak, theoretically, into each county? Uh, and so it gives you the, the portion of uh, districts that each county uh, should have ideally. So in other words, we're just using that ideal number. We know there's some, some wiggle room, but it gives you a good idea of how many um, Senate districts would, would, would fit into a county. And next slide, please. So this, this is the same map, but what I did was I listed all of the counties and I compared uh, what, what this situation was 10 years ago. So in other words, if we compare what happened 10 years ago to now, how many districts did a county, um, does, a, does a county um, get, uh, so to speak, mathematically, you can see which counties grew enough to get to, to sort of get more of a portion of a district and what counties where, who, comparatively grow a little slower or not enough uh, and maybe lost a, a, a portion of, of, of their allotted um, or their share, I should say, of a district. And I noticed the, the Baltimore City is at the bottom and Prince George's County is at the top, which means um, population growth and Prince George's um, sort of gave them the, the biggest uh, increase when you, when, as compared to 10 years ago and the opposite for, for Baltimore City. Um, and that's just sort of to, to, to get everyone to understand sort of how things have to move when we rebalance the districts. And that's it for me, thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Michelle. Um, it's always interesting to see how the numbers move over a decade. 
Yes, now we'll move into the, um, unless there are any questions of the panel for her, I don't think there are. We pretty much understand, I think, what she's got um, for us. Okay, uh, so we're gonna move into um, hearing from the public. And the first person we're gonna call is Jacqueline Coolidge. In the public. And the first person we're gonna call is Jacqueline Coolidge. Hello, can you, can you hear me? Okay, and there's even video. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, good afternoon. Thank you. Hello? Can you? Can, okay, sorry about that. Yes. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jackie Coolidge. I'm representing the League of Women Voters of Maryland. This commission has already heard from several other League members earlier during testimony, uh, so there's not much need to repeat everything uh, except to highlight that the League supports, and I quote, a state redistricting process and standards with maximum opportunity for public scrutiny. We're pleased that the RAC is holding public hearings, uh, which is an improvement over the process from 10 years ago. However, we still have several suggestions for improvement. First and most important, the League is asking this commission to present draft maps that will be available for public comment before the General Assembly votes on them. Let me repeat that. We would like you to present draft maps that will be available for public comment before the General Assembly votes on them. Why are we stressing this point? We've been participating in all the hearings of both this commission and the Maryland Citizens Redistricting Commission. And we've noticed it seems rather difficult for most people to engage on the basis of a blank map or even historic maps. Most comments are fairly general. And of course, there's enough difference of opinion that the map drawers can conclude simply that you can't make everybody happy. But when people see a draft map, they're much more likely to focus on the boundaries and react with specific feedback. That line cuts me off from my allies and my community of interest. That's why we insist on the opportunity for timely public feedback on the draft maps before they come up for a vote. We're calling for the MGA to commit to making draft congressional maps available for at least a month before the expected special session, December 6 through 10, and for a firm announcement about the relevant dates for that special session. We would also like to suggest that the commission put more effort into publicizing these hearings and making it easier for more members of the public to participate. For example, the next virtual hearing should be moved to the evening time slot. So people who work full time uh, will be able to participate. And we hope the hearings really should go on as long as it takes to accommodate everyone who wants to speak. The process for signing up for testimony should allow more time, more lead time, and be made more user-friendly. Turning to the maps themselves, we've already stated our position, which is the same actually as uh, in Congress, both the For the People Act, lead sponsor, our own representative John Sarbanes, and the new Freedom to Vote Act in Congress, that maps should not be uh, drawn to give any party an advantage. But gerrymandering often goes beyond that. Uh, it provides quite often incumbent protection uh, by drawing maps that may have like tentacles uh, to include an incumbent's uh, home address or to include favored donors. And these lines invariably end up splitting up the rest of us. It splits up communities of interest and it really helps uh, feed the cynicism and the ap apathy that deter voters from participating in the electoral process. 
So we would like to remind the commission that the state constitution standards that govern the drawing of the state legislative districts actually should also be used in drawing the congressional districts. The league respectfully requests that the maps this commission submits are fair and effective in representing the citizens of the state. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that we'll move on now to the next person, uh, Nicole Drew. If she's in the waiting room. Uh, Nicole, if you're there, uh, you need to unmute your mic and you can begin. Thank you. Sorry, it's a little weird um, <laughs> with this uh, <laughs> coming into the Zoom and then viewing online. Uh, uh, good afternoon. My name is Nicole Drew. I am a resident of Montgomery County, Maryland. My testimony today is on behalf of the 25 chap Maryland chapters of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, including our Eastern Regional Director, Rosie Allen Herring, who is also a Prince George's County resident. We urge this commission to one, just ensure a fair and transparent process, two, that you consider and re respect any community of interest maps, um, and then also ensure that the voting power and participation is not diluted in communities of color. Delta Sigma Theta is a nonpartisan organization with a thousand chapters in the United States and abroad. And in Maryland, there are a total of 25 chapters, 10 of which are student members at Maryland undergraduate institutions. And the other 15 chapters are members who have graduated from various colleges and universities. Many of the chapters have membership rosters totaling upwards of 900 plus members, each of whom are registered and active voters in every congressional district in this state. And with our collective chapter members, community partners, and the public communities that we serve, we are able to have a strong collaborative impact in the state of Maryland, which is why we are here today to provide a voice to the communities that we serve. The manner in which the districts are drawn affects every political issue, as you all know, from the economy to healthcare to public education. And therefore, we urge that you continue to be transparent and ensure a fair, a fair process. We want to ensure that our districts are represented by politicians that understand and will respect the wishes of the communities that they serve. And when these politicians manipulate maps for personal or political gain, it prevents residents from having our voices heard on policies that affect us. We also ask that this commission consider and respect any community interest maps that are submitted from advocacy organizations such as ours. A good redistricting process will be open and transparent and allowing communities to give input. We ask that you provide the rationale to explain why any map, uh, the maps that are uh, drafted to ensure that there is a transparency uh, and fairness uh, throughout this process. And additionally, in order to build trust um, that the maps are, are not unfairly manipulated, we ask that this commission not draw maps that favor partisanship. Finally, any maps that are drawn should be mindful not to dilute the voting power and political representation of communities of color. Maryland has had its share of critique about the last redistricting process, but we do want to ensure that our voice is considered to ensure a fair, con uh, to ensure fair congressional maps and that there is no racial gerrymandering that will dilute the voting strength of African-Americans and other communities of color. We look forward to our chapters and its members working with you further in this process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on now to the next person, um, Edward Johnson. And, uh, to ensure a fair congressional mass and that there is no racial gerrymandering that will dilute the voting strength of African Americans and other communities of color. We look forward to our chapters and its. Okay, well, we seem to be having a little lag there. So we'll move on now to the next person, um, Edward Johnson. Uh, 
There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Edward Johnson. I'm a co-leader of the Maryland Legislative Coalition and also a member, which is also a member of People Maps Maryland. Back in July, I wrote an opinion piece in that was published in Maryland Matters that said meaningful meaningful hearings can only take place when maps would be are maps would be shown for people to see comment on. Uh, it's hard for people to comment on the win when they cannot see it. And so far, the turnout of your hearings seem to confirm that until there are maps, there's not, there's hard to permit anybody to make comments. There are rumors that you already have produced maps or that you're not going to draw any maps until the special session. I don't know which of those, any of those are true or not. We seem to have lost you, Mr. Johnson. We see you, but we don't hear you. You lost, hold on a second. Can you hear me again? Yes. Where did I leave off? Oh, now I lost you. Okay, um, you were saying, uh, talking about how difficult it was to get either turnout and or feedback without- Right, the turnout for your for your first hearing seemed to confirm that there are, confirm that. There are rumors that you have already produced maps or that you're not going to draw them until the special session. If, how long will the special session last? Because there will be, because the public will probably have many hours of testimony to offer on them and they deserve to be able to see them ahead of time so they have plenty of time to plan, look, and study. A short time frame in which to study them is not good. We think it's reasonable to ask that the commission show these public maps by the beginning of November. The other commission only took two hours to draw the preliminary correctional map, so it doesn't take many hours to produce these. Um, we would like to get have the the special session dates confirmed so that people can get, begin planning for that, and they should be con confirmed as soon as possible. On a slightly different note, some of the rumored people are saying that. We lost him again, audio. Mr. Johnson, we lost you again. Continuous, this is gonna be compact. There are different different ways that these maps can be drawn and the commission needs to explain what methods they're going to use. And I thank you. Thank you very much. We lost a little bit, but I think you did submit some written testimony. Did you? No, I didn't, I did not. Okay, well, we-, we I use, unfortunately I use the Chromebook and it's not works, it does not work well with Zoom. I'm sorry to hear that. Okay, well, um, if you can possibly just uh, send us uh, your which your notes or whatever you were talking uh, through, then we can have the complete thing. We did lose your audio just towards the end. So okay. That would be helpful. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next person up, uh, Mr. Paul Sundell. You need to turn your microphone on, sir. Mr. Sundell. Oh, yes, yes. Can, can you hear me now, please? Yes. Okay, great, great. Sorry, I uh, I uh, failed to hit the right the right button there. And uh, and uh, I I am grateful for the, the opportunity to uh make my thoughts known and i wasn't sure on the length of time that i have to talk you have uh, five, oh, 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 five, yeah, minutes. five five minutes about four and a half now okay uh yes i i i do view gerrymandering as a great pr problem and it goes across party lines and unfortunately at, in many states, the results have been awful and very partisan. And Maryland is among the very worst. A, a, a Xavia, a Philadelphia cartography firm, evaluated gerrymandering of 
of the congressional districts, and Maryland was the very, very was the very was the very worst, and it and it and it does turn out. I view the county I live in. It's probably one of the worst in the whole country, and. And I say that because when one looks at it on the con congressional con on the congressional level, uh, Anne Arundel County is the fourth most populous county in the state. We have no one in con in Congress because we're we're my my minority members by a substantial margin in each of those four districts. And that was not an accident. <laughs> uh, and uh, two, our, leg our legislative districts are just as bad. 20% uh, of our legislative members are in PG County. And again, we're Anne Arundel County is a very is a small minority uh, uh, member. On the numbers that I have, uh, uh, it is uh, it is uh, uh, Anne Arundel County is. Uh, is about 26% of District 21. So, and the gerrymandering is so, it is so bad that on the con, 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 congressional uh, level, no one in the county does run for Congress. And at the legislative level in in district in district 21, I would assume it's very likely the same thing because it's a virtual sure sure loss. So um, I, I, I it's long overdue for politicians to take to go and take principle above above politics because we see what we have now and it's the and it is as bad as gerrymandering gets and i'm a registered democrat uh i'm a read read i'm a retired federal government e e economist as well we need single member districts wherever possible and that's what the what that's what the the governor's uh advisory redistricting committee came up with in their pre 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 preliminary drafts and so please do the the right thing because we we do not have the uh, initiative in Maryland like most of the, of the of the other states have at least twenty three where the citizens where the where the you know citizens can say enough and get it passed. Um, on the, the, the ballot. So, so, so please do the right thing because what we have now is absolutely terrible. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Sundell. Next up is Morgan Drayton. Morgan Drayton in the waiting room. Here we go. Hello. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can now. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Morgan Drayton, Policy and Engagement Manager for Common Cause Maryland. I would first like to thank the Commission for all of your hard work and for centering input from the community throughout the congressional and legislative redistricting proceedings. However, we at Common Cause do have some concerns about the lack of public engagement and full transparency within the redistricting process. Our full remarks and recommendations are included in the written testimony we submitted to the Commission, but I wanted to take the time to address a few of our most pressing concerns here with you today. First, we urge that the Commission release draft maps and line drawing standards for public comment and review as soon as possible, preferably by the end of the month, beginning of November. The earlier draft maps are released, the more time Marylanders will have to assess the drafts and prepare valuable and constructive feedback for the Commission before the final maps are brought to a vote. The opportunity for timely public feedback is crucial to ensuring that the final maps are fair to all voters, regardless of political party or affiliation. Second, we would ask that the Commission push back the start time of the virtual hearing scheduled for October 15th from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Many Marylanders who might be willing to give feedback on the redistricting process are currently unable to attend virtual hearings because they're still at work or school while they're happening. Committing to scheduling meetings outside of traditional work and school hours would go a long way towards making the map drawing process more inclusive and accessible to all citizens. We would also ask that the Commission consider extending the current two hour cap on virtual hearings in cases where there's likely to be significant turnout, especially at the last few hearings where citizens are more likely to be engaged in the process. We believe that if a citizen takes the time out of their day to attend a hearing and is willing to share their opinion, it's very important that they be able to do so, regardless of arbitrary time constraints. Um, again, I would like to thank the Commission for their hard work during this process. Common Cause Maryland and our coalition People's Maps Maryland are dedicated to making the redistricting process as accessible, transparent, and inclusive to all Marylanders as possible. And to that end, we hope the commission will take all of our recommendations into consideration. Thank you, and I'll concede the rest of my time. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I believe you may be on mute. Okay, there we go. I'm sorry. Reading, you know, it's a, it's a skill. Um, okay, so last person uh, on, on my list is Brandon Russell. Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senate President Ferguson, House Speaker Jones, and leaders of the House and Senate for participating in the important work of this commission. I'm happy to have the opportunity to speak with you today about the importance of congressional and legislative districts as they relate to Southern Maryland and in particular, St. Mary's County. Recently, we've seen maps from Governor Hogan's Maryland Citizens Redistricting Commission, which, which suggested removing a portion of St. Mary's County and adding it to another district. I mentioned these maps with the hope of calling your attention to the need of keeping St. Mary's County whole. Currently, St. Mary's County has three elected members in the House of Delegates, representing Districts 29A, B, and C, and one senator representing District 29 as a whole. Overall, District 29 includes the entirety of St. Mary's County, as well as the southern portion of Calvert County. I understand that because of population growth and decline, that districts may expand or contract as needed to meet district requirements. During the process of redrawing these districts, I recommend keeping St. Mary's County whole because our county exists on a peninsula and there are a few options to expand District 29 without including portions of another county. Keeping Southern Calvert or expanding into Southern Charles County are the two options that make the most sense. In St. Mary's County, we have five elected Republican commissioners who appointed five Republican members of our local redistricting board. The community advocated for a fair and balanced redistricting board composed of members from multiple political parties. However, the commissioners ignored this input and instead referred community members to state level redistricting where, quote, the real problem is, end quote. I request the redistricting process produce a legislative map that is not gerrymandered. 
Maryland has the unfortunate label of being one of the most gerrymandered states in the country. Fair representation is important at every level. This is why it is imperative for state level redistricting to produce fair and contiguous districts. Set the standard for others to follow this process in the future. I look forward to reviewing maps proposed by this committee and giving additional feedback in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so I think that unless somebody else has somehow signed up, that concludes our public testimony. Let me also just point out a couple of things in response to uh, some things that were said. We will have draft maps um, uh, for comment. Um, the timing on that is to be determined because we are still very much uh, in the information gathering stage, um, which is best practice, if you will, to try to hear first uh, on, on a more general level, obviously, uh, but that helps us then sit down to try to figure out exactly how we can make all these pieces uh, fit together. Uh, the other thing that I would point out is that, uh, as everybody knows, uh, thanks to um, COVID for one thing and, and other issues, uh, the census data was not released until very late. Normally we get the census data in February. And of course we didn't see it until it was I think September, right? We, we finally did get to see it. So it was very difficult and, and we recognize that things have been kind of constricted and pushed back because of that. But I, I think we'll work very hard to try to get these maps done um, as soon as we can and uh, get them out there so the public can react to them. That's all I have to say for, for now. Is, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, yes. Um, just a question on process. I know our last hearing is November 18th. So when you say we're gonna be having draft maps, are they gonna be done before the November 18th so the public can weigh in that point or you're anticipating having them after we're done our hearings? And then if that's the case, where is the public input going um, if we don't have any more hearings scheduled. You're muted. Um, again, I think the timing is tough. Uh, hopefully we can get it done and get some maps out there before we actually are convened or more accurately, you all are convened into a special session. Uh, but I, I don't know that I... I um, Specifically, I mean, you can, I can take a guess. Um, like to have the draft maps by November fifteenth, if, if that's possible. I mean, we'll we'll shoot for it. I think you have to recognize, though, that you know things can make. It wouldn't be a final. Obviously, it'd never be a final map. But it, you know, we don't know what we're going to hear yet on uh, the rest of our hearings. But if we can get them done, or at least get some drafts out there uh, by the fifteenth of November, that would still give us a couple of weeks to get good good feedback. Okay, and last question on that. So if we got them out by the 15th, there would be one more public hearing, which would be the 18th, which would give them one hearing. Is that the plan going forward? That's where they would get their input to us or would there be any other public venue for them to give comments? Well, I think I can only, all I can say is this, if there's time, sure. Uh, if not, we can go into session. Obviously, you're going to have hearings on the bill, whatever those bills happen to be. And that's also an opportunity for the public to give comment, either person or virtually. I've been, as you know, retired for a number of years, but I understand that uh, the way the legislature got through um, last regular session was in a combination of virtual and uh, on-site um, um, operations. And so hopefully, you know, it's not the end. Um, we can get public input on the maps, consider it, do what we feel we need to do with it. Uh, and then we'll go, if you go into session, basically it's still an open, it's an open thing. It's not a fate to complete. Okay, thank you. Okay, I guess that's it then. Um, I do think we should seriously think about pushing the virtuals back um, to an afternoon, late afternoon, early evening type of thing. I think, uh, it is at the good points that were made. I don't know how feasible that will be for everybody, but I think we should give it very serious consideration.